I have the, the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, um, Dean Hardin Coleman from the School of Education. Dean Coleman um, taught religion, um, was a counselor and a coach in the Quaker schools in Philadelphia, and then was at the Teachers University in Shanghai for many years. And left, when he left there, he was at, at a professor and dean at the University of Wisconsin and um, came here to, to join our faculty, dean, six, eight years ago? Eight, eight years ago. Um, so Dean Coleman is engaged in our community, and I, I can't wait to hear him speak tonight. Um, not only does he um, engage here at the university, but he's the vice chair of the school uh, board in the city of Boston. Uh, Dean Coleman's work focuses on helping adolescents become effectively engaged citizens in a multicultural and pluralistic society. Please join me in, in welcoming Dean Coleman. Good evening, everyone okay? Yes. Great, great, great. So I'm here, um, and I really want to talk about what I think is uh, uh, the verge of a national crisis. And, and I normally don't do hyperbole, because I really think we had a very uh, special and dangerous moment in our, our, our society. And there's a couple symptoms of that, all right? The inequities in the healthcare system, the inequities in the health and the education system, uh, the, the inequities in um, income across the country are really the grounds that around, across history, are the grounds that lead to uh, rebellion and revolution. And we really are at the point where we have such a deeply disenfranchised society in many areas that we have, we're at risk for jeopardizing our core uh, structures. And we see this in many, many ways. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, the violence in our cities, et cetera, et cetera, the school to prison pipeline. These are all things that I think we read in the newspaper, and for most of us, is so far away from our daily lives, we forget that these are the majority of people who are really suffering today. And one of the reasons that I, I hesitate to bring that up in the context of, my, uh, of ethnic minorities is so often if we make this a conversation about race, it remains a conversation about race. But I want to argue that the African American community in particular are historically the canaries in the coal mine of the American society. So we are really the, uh, uh, what happens to us often then leads to what happens uh, to the rest of society. A great example of this, if you follow this in the news, they've been recently doing a lot of work on the Monaghan Report, which is in the mid-1960s, where they were talking about the problems in the African-American community with uh, increasing uh, loss of fathers in the families, increasing unwed mothers, and it was all blamed around race. Well, that was just a predictor of what was going to happen in the poor white community as well. So we really need to think, if, we're, if that's a real indicator of what's going to happen to the whole society, we have to start thinking what could happen to improve the lives of African-Americans today that would then transform transform our society. I want to talk a little bit about that. That's what I really want to talk about today. So the couple of things. So structurally, the, the, the couple of data points you have on your mind. Zip code is the primary predictor of SAT scores. So if you know what, where someone was, lives by their zip code, you can predict how well they'll do in the SATs. Zip codes in the United States are increasingly segregated by race and class. So what we know, what we're seeing, and then the, first, the other data point that you want to look at, and this is true across all selective colleges and unselective colleges, boys are systematically underperforming girls in schools, systematically, no matter where you go. Boys are underperforming. Some of you may think that, that they deserve it, but that's a different issue, all right? <laughs> so if you are poor, if you are black or Hispanic and male, the all the data suggests you're going to fail in American society. That's a deep problem. If you're black, poor, and male, you're more likely to fail than to succeed. And that's a deep problem. The other side of it is there are many African American and Hispanic males who do succeed, who uh, rise to positions of prominence and success in our society. So we want to think about what's their sauce. What's different about them? that allows them to succeed in a situation when most people who look like them will fail. And there are three components of that success. The first is structural, right? African-American, Hispanic-American males who succeed in our society 
are more likely to come from situations where they have access to health care, where they have access to a quality education, and there's some level of family stability. It doesn't have to be two-parent family, but there's family uh, stability often organized around the family having family supporting jobs. So those are structural variables. Those are the things that have nothing to do with the actual kid. Those are the situations in which they are born. And the second component about their success are contextual factors, all right? The things that are in their immediate life, in their immediate life. The kids who succeed are more likely to go to schools where they're highly effective teachers, where those schools have high expectations for everybody and high support systems for everybody in the school. And there's a, the school climate and the community climate is one that believes that these kids can be successful and supports that. Those are the contextual factors. And the final component in their success when you look at these kids and, and, and as adults is that there's some personal factors. So I don't want to suggest that it's all out of the person's control, though most of it is. There's some personal factors. And those are, first of all, social competence. Kids who overcome risk factors, being black, poor, male, or a classic risk factors, are ones who usually have a high level of social competence. And what does that mean? One, they're able to self-regulate their emotions. They're able to delay gratification. And they often, I think this is very important, if I come back again, I want to talk about this in more depth, they also have the ability to demonstrate empathy. Right? They have the ability to understand what other people need and respond to them and engage in them. And they have what generally we think of the good social skills. They also have cultural competence. Right? They also have a strong sense of who they are as a cultural being and what that means in the world. They have a sense of how the world looks at them, thinks about them, and responds to them and have enough sense of personal self that they can engage with the differences, right? That meeting a bigot or a racist or an impolite teacher or all the, all the circumstances that are dangerous in the world, they have the ability to recognize, most importantly, that's not necessarily about them as a person, but about them as a figure in society, and they can respond accordingly. And that, for a third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade boy, is a tremendous act of self-regulation to allow people to treat them as a type and not respond as a type. It's a very powerful moment. You see it, and their sense of cultural self often provided to them from, the, from their family and the models they have in their life it allows them to overcome the risk in their life. So if that's the case, what are the, some of the things that we can do about that? And I think that's very important to start thinking about, that if it's true that some of these kids can overcome the structural factors that put them at deep risk, what are the things that can happen that can do? So I really recommend that if you're really thinking about this, is you go to the Children's Defense Fund website and look at their conversations about poverty. And primarily, the way that we can expand and scale up success for poor, black, Hispanic males is to really address the, cult, the, uh, the poverty in our society. Not the, <coughs> not the cultural poverty, per se, but poverty. That is a, a driving factor in our life. Now, we know that most of the poor are white, right? We know that, right? They're white, they're rural, and they tend to be white rural females, as a matter of fact. That's the dominant uh, uh, group of poverty. But more African American, more Hispanics are also, a high percentage are in poverty. And what can we do about that? And the Children's Defense Fund says it's very clear the things that we need to do. One, we have to increase funds. So we don't have to create new programs. There are going to bring an argument. We don't have to do anything new. We have to finance the programs we have. One, we have to do a much better job at housing subsidies. Right? So one of the things that you'll see in Boston and many urban cities is that many of the poor kids don't know where they're going to spend the night because they don't have stable housing. They may be living in someone's floor, they may be homeless, and they may go back and forth. So imagine being uh, in second grade, third grade, getting to school maybe on time and not knowing we're gonna go home at night. And imagine focusing on math in those conditions. Right? The second is we have to increase subsidized food, right? Uh, in school food, because many of these kids come to school hungry, and many oft times the only meal they're gonna have each day is gonna be that morning meal at school, all right? Which, and for many kids, and you watch this as kids get older, they stop coming because of the shame of having to eat subsidized food. 
subsidized housing, and quality health care is another incredibly important element that everyone needs. The primary reason for absenteeism for school and elementary level kids is dental disease. Right? Dental disease makes you vulnerable for fevers and colds and illness. And so if you don't have quality dental care, you often will be absent from school. And every moment of absence is lost learning, right? So you're coming from behind the eight ball and losing more because you don't have access to high quality health care. Family supporting jobs, right? So subsidized jobs is a critical element for our society. As you, as you can look at the numbers of African-American, Hispanic males who are in jail and where they come out, it's often because they don't have a model of people working in a regular way. Great book, Julius Wilson's When Work Disappears. Families that work, whether they're poor, so working poor, are self-regulating, they're organized in a way that if you don't have jobs, there's no, you lose structure in your life. And these are very important elements. So what can we do? Right? What's our responsibility? At one point, I'm going to make a significant argument is that one of the barriers to change is that we all grow up with this fixed mindset. How many of you have said, I'm not good at math? Right? How many of you said, I'm not good at art? How many of you said, I'm not good at ath athletics? When often it's a matter of it wasn't necessary for you and the world wasn't willing to work with you to acquire what you needed in those areas to perform. And that's called this fixed mindset. And too often, too often in our society, we look at those African-American boys and, and Hispanic boys and said, that's who they are by type. I'm going to lower my expectations. One of the things that uh, the uh, last President Bush uh, had said that I think was very useful is that we should not subject our kids to the soft bigotry of low expectations. And so what does a growth mindset look like? What prevents us from believing that all kids can learn? Right? So creating a system where all kids can learn. I, I recommend that you follow Tommy Chang, the new superintendent of Boston Public Schools, and that's his core element. All kids can learn. And if that's true, what do we have to do to make that happen? And I'm going to suggest it's the adult failure to align around the belief that all kids can learn that is our problem. Because we don't believe that all kids can learn. We don't believe that all teachers can be effective. We don't resource what they need. So one of the big things that I'm going to suggest and argue for all the time is to think about how the adults in our society choose not to care. Choose not to care and act on that caring because they don't think it would make a difference. Thank you very much. So I was told I can have uh, two questions if I went the whole 11 minutes or 15 minutes, and I didn't do it. I got uh, so we can get three questions in. I think is that fair, Daryl? Right. Three questions. Any questions? Comments? Reactions? Anger? Disappointment? Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. So the first thing I wanted to know is that often we talk about these issues, and they seem really large. And um, I want to know what. I want to know what are some practical steps that we as um, college students and as young adults can take to address these issues, and um, if you feel like it's um, if you feel like there's anything that we can do that that would be really impactful. Because sometimes I feel very helpless because it it seems very large. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of different factors that go into um, oppression, especially against you know minorities in America. And um, just how do we deal with it? Whether it's education, whether it's um, social factors, whether it's prison industrial system, whether it's police brutality. Like how how can we actually make a change when it's so big? Great, great question. So the question, just to repeat, is what, as college students, are the type of things that you can do now to have an impact? So at BU, there's a program called the BU uh, Intergenerational Literacy uh, Program, a build, right? And what that does is teach you how to go into a school and work with an individual kid to build their literacy. So we will know we've made changes, and that's one thing I forgot to say, we'll know we'll make changes when third grade reading scores go up, eighth grade math scores going up, dropout goes down, 
and graduation goes up. So what can you do in your capacity to go into some of the schools in Boston or Chelsea or Quincy or other places, other, other gateway schools, and work with a kid to help them move through the process? to give them that voice, to provide them what we'll call social capital so that they, have the, they can learn the skill sets. So tutoring programs, uh, jump start, literacy programs, uh, the Boys and Girls Club. I've had friends that go work at the Boys and Girls Club, afternoon volunteer programs. They're dying for the opportunity to be engaged in adults who want empath empathic, caring, good models of success, who think they're important, right? And spend time with them over time, incredibly important. Another question? Clear as mud at the cover of the ground? Well, great. Well, thank you all very much for your time.